Welcome back for more Bio 20. We're at the end of week five. So we're well past a quarter of the way through the semester. So congratulations. So here we're going to be finishing up our talk on enzymes for this week. They're going to come back a little bit next week, just so you know. But we're going to look at how do we control these things. So you should be able to list and describe three ways to control an enzyme. And then tell me what we mean by feedback inhibition. Remember from previous topics that proteins are insanely picky when it comes to their shape. So they are picky because the bonds that, they, that hold them together are malleable, meaning I can change them. Those bonds, of course being ionic, hydrogen, are the two big ones that we can change. Covalent, you can't really change. Hydrophobic, you can't really change. But these two here, I can manipulate with pH, saltiness, with temperature, and we could also mess with it in terms of other compounds, like we saw with the induced fit model, bringing the substrate close is enough to change the shape. So keeping this in mind, we actually have two major ways that we can actually control enzymes. One of them is we can fight for the active site. So that's one way that we can mess around with what's going on here. The other option is sabotage. So we're going to attack some other spot and force changes on the enzyme. So this is going to be force changes in shape. Let's go with the sabotage one first. That one is referred to as allosteric regulation. So words have meaning. So allosteric basically means a, um, a foreign spot. spot or location, meaning for our purposes, not the active site. So we're just dealing with something that's not the active site. So what you can do is you can have some type of chemical bind to the enzyme in a different location. But by binding to the enzyme in a different location, you're going to change all of the structure. So the result is the entire thing will change. And that will include the active site. And by doing so, you can alter the protein's ability to function. It can be done in one of two ways. We can either make it easier to function, which case we call those things coenzymes, or it can make it more difficult. to function, in which case we call those things inhibitors. We do this a lot in terms of how we run our enzymes and how we control them. So next week we'll point out a few examples, but this is how we regulate our enzymes predominantly. We just have little chemicals that can serve as on and off switches. So Adding a coenzyme would turn it on, but taking away the coenzyme turns it off. If I don't have an inhibitor, the enzyme is turned on, but if I add the inhibitor, you turn it off. So how do you turn it back on? Remove the inhibitor. So that's what this figure here is showing, dealing with allosteric inhibition. So we have the enzyme, we have the active site. We just happen to have somewhere other than the active site, allosteric, some other place. The inhibitor will bind to it, and when the inhibitor binds, the result is we change the active site. And by changing the active site's shape, the substrate can't bind to it anymore. Bah, boohoo, oh well. This is the one that gets fun. And that's when we're fighting for the active site. We call that competition. 
or a competitive inhibitor. And these are always going to be ones that fight for active sites. These are always poisons and venoms and toxins. So that's what these things turn out to be. These are things that we don't use. This is not what we would use. So these are defense and attack options. Um, sometimes they're accidental. So carbon monoxide, which is really, really dangerous, just happens to active or to be a competitive inhibitor for oxygen on hemoglobin. I mean, nothing's intentionally giving you carbon monoxide, but it just happens to fight for the spot where oxygen binds, and it does so better than oxygen, and that's why carbon monoxide is so dangerous for us. So these are going to be chemicals that are going to bind to the active site usually better than the substrate. What are examples of this? It's usually used in warfare, which is kind of dangerous. So ones like sarin gas, just for the sake of giving you that one, because that one I know, like, this much of my pinky's worth. This one actually prevents neuron functioning. So neurons are the cells inside of your brain and your spinal cord and your nerves. So it doesn't let them do their job. The signals don't get to be moved out because it's an inhibitor that's blocking the normal functioning. There's another famous set of examples like uh, tetanus. So that's one where everyone worries about y'all you know, rusty nail, even though it's not the rusty nail that you have to worry about. Or botulism, the which people go and get their Botox with that one. But usually botulism you find from like old cans that are like bulging. That's usually a bad sign not to eat it. What both of these do is they're going to interfere. Whenever you see the word interfere, that's, that's code for a competitive inhibitor. So they're going to interfere with muscle contraction. One of them is going to lock it up and not let it happen in the, or not let it stop. Te that's what tetanus does. It locks the muscle contraction and you can't undo it. So, and botulism doesn't allow it to happen in the first place. So they both disrupt muscle contractions, but they do so in a slightly different manner. There turn out to be some other trickier ways that we can use to control proteins, but they get to be dangerous. So they are specialty items. These are not widespread uses. We are very nitpicky when these get applied. And the way that you could deal with this is asking, how do you cook protein? How would you cook an egg? Well, the easiest way to cook an egg is overheat. So that's the temperature manipulation. Typically what happens when you add heat is you're gonna break hydrogen bonds. And that is the purpose behind getting fevers. What you're trying to do is outside of all the other complicated bits that go along with a fever, but you're trying to cook the thing that's getting you sick faster than you cook yourself. And what does this cooking do? It's going to start to disrupt your proteins. And you're hoping that if you disrupt enough proteins in the thing that's causing you harm, that it's not going to function, your body can fight it off. The catch is you can only tolerate a fever for so long before it starts to go after you. So it's a dangerous gamble. Another option is we can use pH or salinity. And these are going to alter the ionic bonds or the hydrogen bonds. Um, salinity isn't something that we really use, but we use pH quite a bit. So pH we actually use as a regulator. So we have parts of our cells where we can worry about this, namely something called the lysosome. That's where we would see this occur. You would also see this in things like the stomach. If you happen to have a stomach, that's where we actually use pH manipulation to turn certain enzymes on and you turn certain ones off. 
I already mentioned how we could have the activators or those coenzymes. The most famous of all those coenzymes are what we call vitamins. That's why you need to have your vitamins. They usually help your enzymes work. And that's what this one here is showing. So this is a positive version of it all. But we also have this other mechanism, which is called feedback inhibition. So feedback is when something at the end of the chain comes back to the beginning. So feedback would be, I have a microphone and my microphone is right next to a speaker. Well, I'm putting sound into this microphone. It's being amplified through the speaker to be picked up again by the microphone to get amplified through the speaker to get picked up by the microphone and amplified through the speaker. And that's when you get that whoop and that sound gets really loud really fast. That's feedback because we're going to the end and then we come back. So feedback, something from the end comes back to the beginning. Inhibition, meaning let's stop it. There's going to be a lot of chemical processes. We're going to ignore a massive chunk of them, but we're going to look at some next week and the week after. And they turn out to be chemical processes that use enzyme after enzyme after enzyme after enzyme after enzyme. So it's going to be multiple enzymes in a row. Kind of annoying. The question is, how do I know when to turn this entire system off? Do I need to have inhibitors for every single one of them? And the answer is, no, you don't. So, for my first enzyme, I'm going to have a substrate, number one, that's going to make my first product. But my first product is going to also turn out to be the second substrate, which will make the second product, which will turn out to be the third substrate to make the last product. Oops, I put that as a three. And it just so happens that this last product is an allosteric inhibitor to the first enzyme. So the last thing that I make turns off the first thing in this chain, which if you think about it, is pretty darn smart. So how do I know when to turn it off? When I have enough end product. Well, how do I turn it back on again? When I lose my end product. Because the end product is the on-off switch. If I have too much of it, don't make any more. So it, the end product is the off switch. But if you've used all up your end product, there's nothing to turn off the first enzyme, so it turns right back on. It's genius. It's absolute genius. It's self-regulating. You don't need a brain telling this thing what to do. It just does it. Again, we call that feedback inhibition. It's so brilliant. It's so cool. There's a lot of processes in our bodies, especially animal bodies, that use stuff like this. We are not going to talk about too many of them for the remainder of the semester, which is kind of sad because this is used so often. And if any of you are going to be going on to like an anatomy or, a, well, anatomy, no, but a physiology class, it's going to come up again. I'm just letting you know right now, this here shows up so often and it is chef's kiss. Brilliant. The thing that you make is the off switch. So if you have enough of it, you turn off the process. And when do you turn it back on again? When you ran out. It's, ah, oh, so good. So next week, we're gonna look at catabolic, metabolic reactions. You have to start somewhere. Um, it, it's gonna make a lot of you very frustrated. I, there's no way around it. Next week is going to be a lot. There's going to be a lot of really weird words that are going to seem out of nowhere. And basically what we're going to start describing next week and the week after are the really simple ways that plants and animals, and I guess to a degree fungi, technically all of life, 
makes energy? Like, how do we get the energy to do stuff? How do we get the energy so that we can fight against thermodynamics, or at least make it bend to what we need it to do, even though we're not technically fighting against it? That's what we're going to look at for the next two weeks. It's just a lot. It's just a lot of words, so I want to give you the heads up now. You can do it. Lots of people have done it before, but it's going to feel quite a bit. So let's quickly review. What should you be worrying about? So hopefully it's the end of the week. So you have a worksheet due by the end of Saturday. You have in lab, you've turned in your lab number four as a pair, and you should have already taken your quiz. Okay. See you next time.